to fall flat on my face. I'm quite capable of doing that all by myself. As anybody who watches me on television every week can tell you. Oh. Yes, yes, all right, I admit it's not the prettiest thing I've said since we left Liverpool, but that sort of response is uncalled for. Based on my extensive police experience, which amounted to a few months strolling around the streets of Bradford, I deduce that this is incriminating evidence which shows that a crew member helped himself to some of the ship's cargo when he'd left Jamaica last month. I suppose quite reasonably he thought one wouldn't be missed among the thousands on board. Of course, that's what Fletcher Christian thought when he helped himself to a coconut on the bounty. But look how that ended. Still, I can't see the mutiny on the Matina being turned into a film. Come to think of it, we had a banana right there on what's my, what's my line three weeks ago. None of us managed to guess that. We slipped up good and proper there, and with an artificial eye maker called William Shakespeare. Oh, how bitter a thing it is to look into happiness through another man's eyes. I am sure I'm not the first person to point out that only the great Nancy Spain, who spent the war serving in the Women's Royal Naval Service and then made her name as an author by writing a book about her said naval experiences, could turn out to be one of the worst sailors I've ever encountered. Mm. Well, I never actually sailed on a ship, and the only loss at sea I've ever seen is what's actually just gone over the side right now. <laughs> anyway, there's a fine tradition of seasick sailors. Nelson suffered from it, you know. It's a little known fact that his last words were actually sick bag, Hardy. <laughs> Johnny is always telling me, wedge yourself somewhere and don't move. You keep fighting the boat. You have to be part of the boat and not ride it like a horse. Oh, oh God. And I thought fresh air was supposed to be good for Malden Man. And I'm told hangovers. But it appears we've both been badly misinformed. I assumed, quite rightly as it turns out, you would not be joining us below for breakfast. And I thought this might be a more suitable substitute for anything solid. Um, you might be a grumpy old bugger. But sometimes I could kiss you. What? With no audience or any reporters here to witness the event? Oh, very funny. Look. I've said I'm sorry about that story. I don't even remember what it said. Well, Let's know what I said. Allow me to refresh your memory. <clears throat> the Daily Sketch. Is Gilbert Harding thinking of marrying? I hear of a romance between the irascible 47-year-old TV bachelor and novelist Nancy Spain. 
who was 37, before she left London, and told Nancy, said to friends, I am considering marrying Gilbert. It would be a fiery combination, the quick-tempered Gilbert and the sharp-witted bohemian Nancy, who even wears slacks to theatre. Oh, right. Perhaps it wasn't such a good idea for me to get squiffy and make a joke about us getting married when I was in a Fleet Street pub full of reporters. But I didn't think anyone would take it seriously. One of the express boys said, a love affair between Nancy Spain and Gilbert Hardy. Now that's getting into the realms of science fiction. Well, however much an alien concept it might be to us, some of our colleagues in the yellow press clearly didn't think it was oh. out of this world. Well, I feel like I'm <laughs> heading for the next world. <laughs> Is Johnny still having her breakfast? Oh, yes. The formidable Miss Laurie is working her way through the entire menu, as did I. Porridge, cereal, haddock in milk, bacon and eggs, black pudding, <laughs> fried bread. <laughs> well, the pain of Spain is cured mainly by champagne. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know... I always have a glass just before I go on air, on Woman's Hour. Oh, does that make you seasick then? Oh. I must admit, sometimes that programme does make me feel a tad nauseous. <laughs> my preferred tipple before I go on, on is a shot of whiskey and a few puffs on my asthma inhaler, occasionally followed by a pure oxygen chaser. <laughs> I believe the fizz allows me to inject a little pizzazz into the proceedings. I like to think my pieces bring some glamour into the listeners' lives while I'm showing off about my adventures in Paris or Las Vegas, or in this case, Jamaica. So if I feel bubbly and excited, the chances are they will too. Well, remind me to have a bottle of ice on, uh, a bottle of bottle of ice next time I'm doing 20 questions in Ashby de la Zouche. <laughs> God knows that could do with some glamour. <laughs> do cheer up. Just remember, a few weeks ago, you were at death's door, and now here you are, on an exotic boat journey to the West Indies to languish in the sun while enjoying the abundant hospitality of your dear old Cambridge chum, Hugh Foote, who's graduated to the position of governor of that tropical colony. Thus far, this exotic boat journey has mostly involved staying below deck while a Force 10 gale rages over our heads, watching you and Miss Laurie plough on with your new project while I stare at a blank page. Do you know... The last time I was actually on a boat was in 1944. It was the Aquitania, and I was on my way to work for the BBC in Canada. The boat was crammed with Canadian officers and their war brides. One of the brides was on her way to join her husband in Winnipeg. She was so young, so full of happiness and hope. She showed me a photograph of her new home, which her husband had sent her. But I didn't have the heart to tell her it was a photo of the Canadian Parliament building. <laughs> Lincoln was right. Marriage is neither heaven nor hell, it is simply purgatory. Oh. Well, are you having a quarrel? My glass is down below, it is empty, as is the bottle from which it was filled and refilled several times, and which provided the perfect accompaniment to our hearty breakfast. You are holding the remainder of said bottle in your hand. Well, that's a good way to start the day. I thought the whole point of this trip was to improve your health on doctor's orders. I haven't trusted, trusted doctors since the day that my father went into hospital to have his appendix removed and my mother became a widow at 30. And I ended up at school for orphans. You know, when I first went to Canada, my chief annoyance was the local attitude to drink. You had to get a permit. The whole situation was preposterous. Do you know that when I was a teacher in Cyprus, alcohol was actually cheaper than milk or water wow. because there was no tax on it. And no doubt, therein lies the origin of your current maladies. You're perfectly well aware, are you not, that you had the whole nation on tenterhooks when you were so ill in hospital last month? Look at how the public responded to the news. You were inundated with baskets of fruit and flowers, your fan mail tripled, and the telegram delivery boys were on their knees. Not for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and my housekeeper in Brighton told me the papers were phoning her twice a day to ask if I'd had a relapse. Of course, they could have been referring to any number of things. <laughs> Some of the chaps at the Express were already writing your obituary. They were asking me for quotes. So I don't want to have to start sending telegrams back to Fleet Street giving my first-hand account of the last days of my dear friend, Gilbert Hardy. Nonsense. We know, both of us, that you'd positively relish landing a scoop like that. 
It could make you even more famous than I am. Oh, no one in Britain is more famous than you, with the possible exception of Princess Margaret. Uh. And even she doesn't drink as much as you do. <laughs> or hog the headlines. I do not hog the headlines. I just seem to feature in a lot of them. Which is something I'm going to go out of my way to avoid, unlike you. But what really baffles me is that whenever I say or do anything indiscreet, there just happens to be a reporter or somebody in the vicinity. Well, this time there's only me. In which case I'm doomed. Do you think I actually enjoyed all those stories that emanated from my hospital ward? Gilbert Hardy ordered to rest. Gilbert Hardy exhausted. Though I think my favourite was Gilbert Harding sinking. <laughs> which, given the gale force winds we've encountered on this journey, could prove prophetic. <laughs> Well, they made a nice change from some of your other headlines. Gilbert Harding in dinner row. Gilbert Harding ordered out. And will Harding get the sack? Well, don't talk to me about bad headlines. We hadn't been on this boat two days before you sent back a story entitled The Trouble with Gilbert. You know, I've always thought that the root of good manners was the phrase women and children first. But you're helping me to change my mind on that. Just so there's no misunderstanding, if we're shipwrecked, my gramophone player shall be the first in line. Oh, and I wouldn't blame you. Whereas I would save my typewriter. Because Lord knows it saved me. From what? Oh, poverty. Obscurity. Drudgery. It serves a purpose, then. I expect you take that as your luxury item if you're on desert island is. I should think so. Mm -hmm. Although I'm just as likely to plump for a bottle of bubbly. What was yours again? Was that your gramophone? No, I asked for a Kelly man. Oh, <laughs> of course. No Kelly girl for you. Oh, I would know better than to inflict myself on a woman permanently, however fictitious the circumstances. But I've always thought that this premise about there being only one castaway on an island is quite unrealistic. <laughs> There's no reason for supposing there aren't going to be at least two castaways. In our present situation, it would be a good deal more than that. Just think of the incompatibility. <laughs> Oh, I'll say. Your eight choices of music doing battle with mine. My tales from the Vienna woods versus your I'm knee deep in daisies. <laughs> Sussex by the sea up against the Boat Island song. How apt. Would that really be one of your choices? Well, it would be if they asked me to do it now. I've got islands on the brain, Jamaica notwithstanding. In lieu of my dream of one day having a home on a Mediterranean island, Johnny and I have just bought a piece of one of the islands on the Thames, near Hampton Wick. Excuse me for stating the blindingly obvious, but given your current malady, is there not something incongruous about almost verging on the perverse about your constant desire to have a foothold on a small holding surrounded by a large expanse of water? Well, we've got this 14-foot boat in our front garden that we bought some months back, and the neighbours are starting to glance askance, so we thought the best place for it was somewhere on the river. <laughs> But you do have a point, and all this watery talk is not going down too well. And I need to get my stomach back on track, on an even keel this morning, because I'm supposed to be spending some of this time rustling up ideas for the cookery book I'm thinking of doing. And at the moment, solid food is the last thing I want to think about. Well, I have a trunk full of medication on board. Before we set off, our charming captain asked if I wanted it labelled as not wanted on voyage. I said only if he wanted to conduct a burial at sea halfway through the journey. <laughs> so I have abundant supplies of sleeping pills, opiates, amphetamines, ephedrine. In fact, it is entirely possible that the only medicine I haven't packed is a cure for your bloody seasickness. <laughs> so maybe you should just stick to the champagne. It's not, I know it's what I'm going to intend to do for the rest of the journey. Is that wise? You've been warned to give up smoking and drinking and rich food. Yes, I am now a man who must always be giving up things. <laughs> the doctors have even told me to give up bending. <laughs> well, that shouldn't have been difficult. I've never been much of a bender anyway. <laughs> I could take it or leave it. <laughs> well, as soon as I was prohibited from bending, I began to feel strong cravings for little bends at all moments. <laughs> But for my strong willpower, I might be now a secret bender. <laughs> I don't know how to break this to you, but in certain circles, that might not be a secret. Yes, and nor might it be a secret that I have suffered from poor health all my life. I was born short-sighted. I have chronic bronchitis and asthma. 
They found a spot on my lung and a rare heart condition, and to top it all, they think I might be developing emphysema. Doesn't leave me much scope for being a hypochondriac, does it? <laughs> Whereas I am a hypochondriac and proud of it. Ever since I can remember, I've been taking pills for this and powders for that. When I was a child, my parents considered me rather a sickly brat, so my mother used to take me on long walks through Jesmond to try and get some colour in my cheeks. I remember when I was about six, we were walking through the park and someone shouted, bugger! <laughs> so I asked my mother, what's that? And she said, it's where one man puts his thing up another man's bum and jigs up and down. <laughs> and I laughed so much, I had to hang onto a tree. <laughs> well, after that, I didn't stay a sickly brat for long. In fact, I became all hips and thighs and wondered where in the name of heaven I was going to put my large red hands. Never again will I doubt the benefits of fresh air and ruthless honesty over modern medicine. <laughs> Speaking of ruthless honesty, I am afraid I might have acquired a reputation as a secret drug addict. I caused a bit of a stink with one of my book reviews last week. I ploughed my way through Huxley's Doors of Perception and dismissed it as dangerous, cranky, rubbishy talk. Perceptive and provocative, but hardly proof of addiction. Well, indeed not. But then I ended it by saying, the awful thing is, I should love to take half a gram of mescaline, just once. Oh, shall I go and check my medicine chest? I wouldn't be surprised if one of my more degenerate doctors had slipped in some of that as well, just to see whether expanding my mind would improve my mood. Um, no, thank you, Matron. I find that confessional is the only thing that gives me relief and refreshment. And everybody knows that the best psychiatrists are priests. Well, only devout Catholics believe that. I hardly qualify as one of those. Shall I tell you what I believe? I believe in the aristocracy, money and talent. And I believe that champagne tastes better than water. Which is one of the few beliefs that we share. <laughs> that and our belief in filling our diaries with ridiculous work schedule. And yet all this frenetic activity has devoid of any sense of purpose. Still, I suppose it keeps me out of the workhouse. And I don't want to go back there having been brought up in one. Perhaps that's why I find it impossible to turn down any offer of work. Well, what about you? Oh, I didn't really have any choice in the matter. After I was invalided out of the Wrens, I had to my name a disability pension of two pounds a week, a ration book, an identity card and a typewriter. Armed with this, I set up shopping in a bedsitter in Kilburn. I rose at five every morning, and within ten years, I'd written ten detective novels, two autobiographies, several children's books, and a biography of my great-aunt, Mrs Beaton. My great-grandfather, Samuel Smiles, said in his self-help book, energy accomplishes more than genius. So it must have been his work ethic I inherited. I'm not sure I learnt it at school. Roding was great fun, but I learnt virtually nothing. It was all rather regimented. Yet somehow there grew a misapprehension among the burghers of Brighton that the girls at the college, as it was known, were waited on hands and foot by the teachers, like we were all scoured O'Hara, with mistresses fussing about us like mannies on the edge of the surf dam. Well, I enjoyed a few little Lord Fauntleroy years myself. When my parents were running the Hereford workhouse, people waited on me and called me Master Gilbert. And I never once saw my mother make a bed or clean a, a pair of shoes. I acquired a false sense of grandeur. Then, of course, my father died young and we were forced to live outside of that rarefied environment. I found out that, after all, I was not some kind of princeling. In fact, my family and I were regarded as little better than the unfortunate workhouse inmates. Little Lord Fauntleroy was, in fact, little more than Little Dorrit. Have you ever thought of writing a novel based on your Dickensian experience? Good heavens, no. Living through my school days once was enough, let alone having to revisit them. That part of my past can stay exactly where it is. You may have a point. The headmistress at Rodine has never forgiven me for setting my thriller, Poison for Teacher, in an all-girls school. <laughs>